Hi, it's Wednesday, July the 3rd, and I continue to read and wonder my way through the book of Revelation. Uh, today it's Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Uh, chapter 1 was largely sort of introduction, uh, just sort of setting the, uh, setting the context for this vision that John has on the Isle of Patmos. Uh, and then chapters 2 and 3 are some words to the seven churches to whom this letter is basically addressed. So um, we've heard some, some of the churches mentioned. Uh, yesterday it was uh, um, Theotira and, uh, and, and, and a Jezebel, who is a leader within that community, uh, leading them into moral decay and spiritual um, adultery and all sorts of stuff. Not, not good. Uh, and today we're going to hear some words to the church in Sardis. So, um, so let's get on and see what we get. So it's Revelation chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and, and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come to you. Yet you have still a few persons in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. If you conquer, you will be clothed like them in white robes, and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Okay. Well, the message is fairly consistent to all the churches, you know, basically saying part of you is good or you have been good, but you guys need to get better at being good. Um, but it... Um, so in my head, and this is this is just in my head, but who knows, it might be relevant. Um, so I would suggest to you that in, in the first century, Sardis is a city in decline. It has been a great city but it is no longer as great as it once was. You know, it's like one of those places where, you know, the highway used to run through it and everything thrived, and then they rerouted the highway uh, in, in another direction, and then the, what was a great city just becomes sort of a town, right? Um, just not as, as, as big a deal, and so the businesses have closed. Uh, Sardis was once a place of, you know, uh, of, 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 of a lot of commerce and trade and all those kind of things. It's not so much anymore. Other cities have grown up and become bigger and greater. So it is a it is a faded gem, I suppose. Uh, I think also that historically there's something about Sardis that it's like it, it could have been great but never really was or that kind of thing. And I don't know whether this is, you know, relevant um, to this letter, whether this is something that, that, that John uh, is thinking about when he writes this. But... Um, I mean, as soon as I hear, hear Sardis, um, I immediately um, flip to, well, okay, I was a classicist a long time ago. So my brain goes back about 600 years before, uh, like 550, 545 BC, um, before Common Era. So, so about 600 years earlier. Uh, in the siege, uh, like I know, I remember the siege of Sardis, which is when um, the Greeks took it um, from from the Persians, and, and the Persians held Sardis because uh, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a city up on a on a, on, a, on a great sort of on a great cliff, and there's no way to get up that cliff, and so you know they figured they were relatively untouchable, um, they were safe up there, and they became somewhat complacent, um, and. Uh, and I have you know images in my in my mind of of like uh, Helm's Deep in uh, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. I know geek reference, but if if you know Lord of the Rings, you watch the movies, read the book. You know Helm's Deep is this place. Well, nobody could ever take it because it's 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 just impossible to 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 get through that. You know the cliff, the sheer wall of it all. You're never going to get through it, so it's it's easy to defend, um, and you become complacent. So I know historically what happens. They, yeah, they were very complacent, uh, but the Greeks were very observant. And was, the story was of a, of a soldier, a Persian soldier who was defending it, 
um, he, he he lost a helmet. It fell. Um, and this is observed. And so he took a secret path down to collect his helmet and then went back up the secret path. So the Greeks saw that. And then in, 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 the, in the cover of night, they went up that secret path and boom, suddenly they were inside the defenses and took Sardis quite easily. So for hundreds of years, Sardis is a place where people are complacent. Uh, they think they've got it but they don't really. They think they're untouchable, but they're very touchable. Uh, they, you know, they, they think they're secure, but in fact, they're very vulnerable. So that kind of works for me. Then again, I don't know if that's what's, what, what John's saying, but he says, you have a name of being alive, but you are dead. You think you're secure, but you're not. You call yourself a church, and by the way, you do all the great churchy things. It's not saying that you are dying as a church, but it's saying that you are, in a sense, lifeless as a church. So as, as, a, as a faith community, for all I know, they were uh, very busy. I think they were doing lots of things, and they were observed to do lots of things, but they were doing them without really connecting to the core of their faith. They were dead. If we're talking about a person, it's like you look like you're doing all the right things. Uh, you're involved in this activity and that activity. And you do this, you do that, you say this, you do. You got all the stuff covered. But the truth is, there's no real connection between you and God, you and your faith as you're doing it. You're just doing it because because you're used to doing it. Um, or, or you think that there's some kind of uh, reward beyond this life. Or there'll be some kind of payoff in this life that that you know uh, is, is is financial or you know that kind of thing. So you have a name of being alive. I mean, you have a good reputation, but the truth is, inside you're you're not connecting to God. You're 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 dead. I, I hear those words and I and I and I get that. Um, and and that's a thing that that a lot of clergy, I think, um, I don't mean struggle with, but I think that if we're healthy. Uh, we reflect on that, right? I'm paid to do a whole bunch of things. You know, I, I always love it when people will come to me and they go, well, you know, I, I, I don't get to church as often as I should. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. And I'll look at them all and say, look, I'm not going to criticize you. I'm paid to be there on Sundays, <laughs> right? I mean, if I paid you, you'd show up too. Uh, and I have to ask myself, so how involved would I be if I wasn't paid? If I wasn't facilitating Bible study, would I go? If I wasn't paid to maintain a ministry and a connection. Would I do these daily meditations, the ones that we're doing here? Right? Would I? Would I do that if I wasn't being paid? Would I just keep doing it. Would I really work on my faith if I wasn't concerned about providing more for my community? Um, would I just sort of let it go? So, am I doing this because you know, because um, I am supposed to? I'm getting paid, and uh, I mean. <laughs> I'm, I'm having a vacation, coming up to a vacation pretty soon, so I'll, I'll have at least, I think I'll have three Sundays off um, before, by the end of this month. Uh, I'm going to take three Sundays off. Will I go to church on those Sundays? Will I engage in a spiritual practice? Will I go to somebody else's church? I don't know. I might just stay home, sleep in, read the Sunday paper in the morning. Uh, will I do that? Is that because uh, I have a name of being alive, but actually inside I'm dead? Um I, I, I don't have the answer to that. Um, but it's it's fair to reflect on that. I think it's fair for any of us to reflect on it. How real is my faith? It may look good, but is it? And, and I don't, for me, this isn't about what I'm proving to Jesus so that I am, so that I can avoid punishment. The question is, is for me, am I wasting my time? If everything I'm doing is just on the surface and it's just to please a, a, a God that I think is vengeful. Um, am I just wasting my time? Right? That, that's how it, 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 it comes to me. Um, and, and so that's part of my reflection for today that I'm invited into. Here it says, okay, so you're, yeah, you're not, you're not connected. You, you have a great reputation, um, but you're dead. So wake up, getting all that. Strengthen what remains, so focus on what you need to do, um, and, and, and uh, you know, focus on what you need to do, and that part of you that's just almost dead. Um, 
for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of God. So, you know, you're, you're disappointing me, that says. Um, so remember what you received and heard and obey it and repent. If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, Jesus says. So if you don't snap up, snap out of it and, and get focused on it, I'm going to come like a thief. And do what? <laughs> I'm going to come like a thief and you'll not know at what hour I come to you. When, when, when other gospels, uh, when gospels like, you know, in, like Matthew talks, uh, has Jesus saying, you know, talking about sort of um, a, a second coming, uh, a time of Armageddon, um, and saying, you know, I will come like a thief. You wonder, what does that mean? Coming to steal something? Coming to uh, thieves? doesn't say I'm going to come like an assassin. It's going to come like a thief. What? What does it, what, what, what's going to happen? What's going to be taken from me? What is the nature of this threat? I don't know. Um, I do know it says that I'll come like a thief. And later it also says um, that um, if, if, if you conquer, you will, you will be clothed like them in white robes and I will not blot your name out of the book of life. So it sounds to me like I'm going to come like a thief and blot your name out of the book of life. Now, what that means is hard to say, although later in this, in, 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 in Revelation, uh, yeah, the middle of, you know, or the second half of, of, this, of this letter, um, that if you're not in the book of life, then you are going to burn, basically, in a lake of fire. So you are going to be damned. You're going to um, suffer uh, in, in the afterlife. So, although that isn't, consistent with what a thief can do to you the idea though is if you don't get it together you are going to be damned I end up today with the same question I had yesterday does this sound like Jesus that I've met in the gospels does Jesus utter threats does Jesus damn anybody did Jesus damn Pilate or Caiaphas or Attis or, or, or anybody or threaten damnation and suffer. I, I, I don't get it. I just don't understand. Um, and, and, and that's where I, I, I struggle. Um, this Jesus is not consistent for me with the Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus that reveals the character of God. Right? Even... even even the, 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 the God in the Hebrew scriptures that can be vengeful. Um, I mean, you know, in the Exodus, when the people are whining and complaining, you know, God had an earthquake and swallowed up, I think it was 18,000 of them, they just died. They weren't sent into eternal torment. They just died, which, you know, isn't a good thing. But, you know, when people sometimes talk about, yeah, well, you know, the Old Testament... Uh, God, or you know, the God of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, could be really, you know, uh, vengeful. Yeah, but not this kind of vengeance. Where does this come from? So this goes back to where I was yesterday. Going, like, I think this this is a voice from the margins. This this is a a, a cult that have a, a certain understanding of Jesus, and it and it's based on the suffering they've been through and the desire to wreak vengeance on those who have hurt them. Jesus is coming. He's coming after them. Um, you know, you still have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. Um, and, <laughs> and I've heard people talk their way through that one. You know, well, you know, uh, when, when you when you you know, give give to um, to to an idol, you know. So again, those pagan practices, uh, you had to be dressed perfectly. Um, so that's what this is about. So those, you know, some of them still are, are, are perfect and ready to give to idols, but, but, but give to idols. No, that doesn't make any sense. Um, you know, I would be saying, but it's still a few of you who have insisted uh, that you have perfectly clean clothes so you can keep giving to idols and be in two groups at once. That would be fine. But when they say not soiled your clothes, I mean, the flip side of that is the sign of baptism, of course, is the white robe. 
So there are some of you who continue to live into your baptism. You've not soiled your clothes. That makes sense. If you conquer, you'll be clothed like them in white robes. So you will be living into your baptism. You'll remember what it is to be part of this community. And in that, I will not send you to eternal damnation. I won't blot your name out of the book of life. That makes more sense to me. The other thing that also makes sense to me is that this is an idiom. Um, people have not soiled their clothes. Um, how do I say it? Uh, respectfully. Um, I mean, I think, I really do think that this is, is more of an idiom saying, you know what, there are some people who, you know, there are some people who have not crapped bed. <laughs> um, and, you know, basically some people who haven't ruined everything. Um, so you may be familiar with, with with a phrase, much like I just said, oh yeah, he crapped the bed, uh, except that that's not quite the word we'd use. I, I wonder if this, I don't know, you, you, he, he didn't crap his pants, um, although they didn't wear pants uh, <laughs> so much. Um, so I, I think it's that kind of expression. I think this is just... Uh, just just a, a comment to him say, yeah, you know what, but there are some people who have not messed this all up. Uh, and, uh, and they're going to be okay. So be like them. Stop messing everything up. And, 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 and I will stay on your side. I will confess your name before my father and before his angels. So now we've, we've got this whole image of, of God and some angels who are judge and jury. Jesus is the witness saying, no, no, I know Bob and Bob's good. He didn't crap the bed. He's my buddy. Arm around him. Okay, you're good. Come on in. You don't have to go to the lake of fire. Is that anything like the Jesus who said, blessed are the poor and blessed are the meek? Uh, the Jesus who, who, you know, who, who reminded me um, that I shouldn't judge people uh, lest I be judged that, you know, when I'm without sin, then I can start throwing stones. But until then, really um, work on your stuff. Uh, that, that makes more sense to me. So my takeaway for this uh, is, is wondering about the earnestness of my faith. Uh, not the eagerness. Um, that's a Paul thing uh, from 2 Corinthians, uh, judging earnestness uh, against eagerness. So it's not enough to just be doing all the right things, but the thing is, am I really connecting? So that's what this is about. Are you really connecting? Are you really alive in your faith? Or are you looking alive but really dead? Is it a zombie faith, I'd call that. Um, and that's f a fair thing for a community to consider, but also as an individual to consider. Um, and then, as I say, it gets confused. I will come like a thief. And what? Thieves don't kill. Thieves don't damn. Thieves take something. What is it that you're going to come and take? My, my peace? My hope? If I don't live faithfully, like really connect to my faith, does it happen that one day I kind of wake up and I am despairing and I have no hope? And I wonder where my hope went and how will I get it back? Well, that makes some sense. You know, that Jesus just comes and takes my faith away and I, my, my faith, my hope away because I have not been valuing it. I haven't been nurturing it. I haven't been cherishing it. Maybe and suddenly that's when my hope is gone or my peace is gone or my faith is gone. Maybe that's what I'm hearing. That makes some sense. But I would like to think I can get that back. But, you know, if my name is blotted out of the book of life. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, I'm going to leave it with you to think about, and I'm going to offer a prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, thank you. Thank you for the testimony of John and the opportunity to wonder about these words. To wonder if these are the words of Jesus, if these are the dreams of John. And regardless, hearing your word emerge from what has been written and what has been shared. 
God, as we hear your word, may we be drawn to your word and may we truly grow in faith. May we be alive in our faith and not and not zombies moving about faithfully but having no living connection. May we have a living connection to you, God. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, that's it for me today, but I look forward to talking tomorrow. Until I get to see you, God bless you. Uh, please know that God sees you and knows you. God's love comes to you. And if you are feeling faded or even on the edge of death, that love does come to you and can reinvigorate you, reanimate you. And the way you share that love matters because that's what it is to be blessed, not just to receive that love, but to let that love throw, flow through you into the world. So bless you. And thank you for being you. And, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. God bless.